believe what you tell them. Um, you have to be a risk taker, uh, a big spender, doesn't hurt, that's part of the bulletproof image. You have to have more than a little chutzpah, and, and often and usually you have an addictive personality. They say for men it's normally a greed factor, and for women it's normally a need factor. In other words, a woman might create fraud because she's got a sick kid or needs to pay tuition. Usually for a man, it's, he wants the money for drugs, women, alcohol, or in my case, you just want to look good. You want to look smart with money, the American way. I would like to say I was good at it, but that would be bragging about something I'm not very proud of. Uh, I was good at it, for one thing. Uh, the situation was there because I had a lot of money sitting in accounts that nobody was looking at. There was a degree of luck involved. Uh, you know, problems did arise. Uh, you know, complaints were made occasionally, but they weren't so often as to, for people to think, well, there's a huge problem there. Uh, a number of people believe there was maybe a problem there, but he surely he can work out of it. Look how much money he makes. And for a lawyer in Memphis in 1993, I made almost a million dollars practicing law. That's a lot in Memphis for a sole practitioner. And it goes along with the bulletproof image. In fact, I, I never worked as hard in my life as I did the last year because I was desperate to keep the float up. What I was doing, though, is doubling up and catching up and finally in desperation I tried to manipulate the Chicago soybean market. I was trading up to a million bushels of soybeans a day and uh, on this, quote, foolproof system that my broker had and people in Chicago saw me coming long before I got there and I lost almost two million dollars in a year and a half. And that trying to double up to catch up to put the money back in the account is what uh, made for all the sleepless nights. But I actually, I never was, quote, caught. In fact, what I did was, uh, as you can imagine, there was no way to, that's no way to live a life because uh, that's all you can concentrate on. You can't take a vacation. You have to be there every day for that 835 phone call to the bank. You have to juggle the money. You have to keep it away from your staff. Uh, and I finally went to a group of attorneys and I said, here's the problem. I'm ready to throw up my hands, but, you know, if there's any way I can borrow this money, because I couldn't borrow it from my parents, I just uh, couldn't put them through that. They had loaned me money before, but the shame of that would have been too much for them. And uh, the attorney said, well, let's go talk to the title companies. And they proposed a workout plan where I would, they would put up $4 million, that's how much I was now overdrawn in the account, and I would pay them back over like a five-year period of time or longer. And all but one of the title companies in Memphis agreed, and next day the house of cards fell apart. So uh, the reason I got caught is because I went and told them about the problem. But the end was coming. I could always see the end. I mean, it when it, when it went from $2 million dollars to four million dollars, I knew there was no way I could work out of it anymore. When it was a million to two million, I knew. I thought, you know, I can I can just stop right here, and I can just start putting back two or three hundred thousand a year. Nobody's going to see this. I can work out of this. It'll take some time. But as problems continued, I got more desperate, and I decided to go to the commodity market and show them how smart I was. Let's assume for a minute that the auditors are, have not been to a fraud class and they don't know what the classic profile of a defrauder is. The first red flag should always be, is the person who I'm auditing controlling the flow of information to me? Because if they are, there's a reason. And the reason is he's trying to lead you away from the problem area. Uh, all the auditors that were sent in in my cases were usually there because a complaint had been lodged against me. So the auditors coming in, I mean, they were coming in knowing that there was a potential problem, yet they only looked at their little problem area. If any auditor had called the bank and said, 
Does he show up on your overdraft list in the mornings? Does he have to come in and cover yesterday's checks with today's deposits? They would have known there was a problem. They knew the complaint said that I was slow in paying off loans on house that closed, yet they never bothered to call any mortgage companies, any other mortgage companies, to see if they had the same complaint. They would have found out. Lots of people would say, yeah, he always sends them in two or three weeks late, but nobody bothered to ask them if I was slow on sending in the payoffs. Um, the Probably the key element other than controlling the flow of information was the fact that I refused to let anyone audit my escrow account. I mean, you know, if the, if the problem is that I'm using my escrow account improperly, how, could you, how can you get around not auditing the escrow account? And yet I was always able to convince them that they didn't need to do that. The title companies, the bar, HUD, everybody, because I said plausible things. Um, another element would be the depositing of checks for a closing before the closing took place. If they had gotten hold of that bank account, they could they would be able to see I was depositing checks for Friday's closings on Thursday or Wednesday. The checks I was depositing weren't even dated until Friday, but sometimes when I had to cover those checks that had come in from the night before, I would go ahead and stick the check in from the mortgage company for the new loan two days before closing. Of course, if the house didn't close, you have a little problem and some more lies to make up. But all of these things could have been detected if somebody had just said, we've got to see that escrow account. An attorney type privilege was a, a, a thin ruse to keep people from getting into it. Uh, and any auditor worth his salt should have demanded to see that because it would have shown everything. And yet nobody did that because they believed what I told them. They believed that I was so high profile and so accommodating that, you know, it must be true what I was saying. But the flags were all there. Just a couple of phone calls would have made all the difference and told what had happened. No, they didn't know that I had an addictive personality, and they probably didn't know that I was trying to be a charmer, whether I was or not, but they certainly should have known that I was controlling the flow of information, and that is really one of the key elements in being able to successfully commit a fraud. Take it from the top, the first thing is, I was an auditor, I would beware of any person who is in a position of trust, uh, because the only people that can defraud you are people that you trust. If someone thinks that you don't trust them, it's very unlikely they're going to try to cheat you. So if you have a person in a position of trust who vacillates from being hard-nosed to being overly accommodating, that's because he's trying to lead you away from the problem. He's going to start out by over-accommodating you, giving you all this information you haven't even asked for yet in order for you to use that information to do your audit. So that would be the first thing I would be aware of, is people who vacillate back and forth between being over-accommodating and being hard-nosed. Second was you need to understand the business you audit. Understand the people you're auditing, they know their business intimately. They, the fraud is usually not what is seen. It's, it's anomalies of the fraud. It's patterns that really don't make sense if you understand the business. Uh, I would be able to tell my bank, well, the reason that checks are here is because I don't get a check from the mortgage company for the new loan for two or three days after the closing. That sounds plausible because it's partly true it happens sometimes. But I was doing 150 closings a month, and that was only happening on 10 closings. Really, the opposite was true. Uh, I was getting in so much money, I was bound to have a huge float in my escrow account. You know, but yet I would say, well, you know, the seller gets up from the closing, he goes straight to his bank, it hits my bank by the next day, and I hadn't even put in the check yet, and people bought that. So if you're an auditor, you need to know the business, know about the business you're auditing. You need to know what questions to ask and who to ask. Don't ask the person who you think is a defrauder. He has a plausible answer. Don't let him control, can control the flow of information to you. Go to other sources. Check out and see if other people are having the same complaints that you're in there investigating. If you don't do that and all you concentrate on is one small aspect of a problem, he'll shift the problem away until you go away. 
and then the problem will come back somewhere else. Um, bank statements in this day and time often are not accompanied by checks. You know, they just show the amount. And so what I would do a lot of times, I would do a closing, and it would look balanced. And I would take the payoff check, and I would change the payee on it to my uh, stockbroker or to another one of my accounts to create a float and kite the money back and forth. Yet, if you're a title company auditor and you look, you say, well, yeah, I see where the check and the closing number 1125 was for 82000 and I see where it cleared three days later. Yeah, it cleared. It cleared into, you know, my stockbroker's account. That they don't see that. They don't see the check. They only see what looks like that check that was cleared. So if you're doing audits of companies or whoever, you need to get the bank statement and the checks, and you need to get them from the bank. You don't get them from the def guy that's the potential defrauder because he's going to lead you away from the problem again. Um, another area that you wouldn't think uh, would be important is vacations. When you're a, a defrauder and you're really good at it and you've created a huge problem, there are no vacations. You can't leave your office when you're overdrawn four or five million dollars. You have to be there every day. You have to be there to juggle the money. You have to be there to keep the fraud going, to keep your people in your office from knowing what's happening. And in many situations where people are defrauding from their company's employees, those employees are loyal about working. They don't want somebody else doing their job while they're gone and discovering the problem. Um, the last thing I would mention is lifestyles. It frequently happens uh, when there's a situation of fraud that the defrauder has had a dramatic lifestyle change, normally an increase. And uh, you need to be uh, aware or beware of the inheritance excuse, because that's the excuse a lot of times people use, oh, well, Uncle Joe died, so that's how I got the money to do this or that. But if you have an employee who's in a position of trust, if he's hard-nosed and vacillates between being hard-nosed and over-accommodating, if he never takes vacations, if his lifestyle has changed, there's a real potential there for there to be a problem. And you need to look at that, and you need to look at the whole business you're auditing and not let the defrauder control the information. My final thought would be for CPAs, accountants, internal bookkeepers is uh, that the reason they get in trouble is because of what they don't do. They don't go the extra mile to find out if other people are having the same problem that you're having. So that would be my final thought is do the due diligence that you need to do and do your homework and know about the business you're auditing and check, check what people tell you, especially if somebody's controlling the information to you. Check it out and see if the information he's giving you is correct.